Open your Bibles this morning to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. The church in Ephesus was one of the more prominent churches in uh, the uh, very first century. We see that the Apostle Paul uh, started the church, but then he probably spent more time with the people at the church of Ephesus than any other church in his ministry. Uh, This was a good church. It was a solid church. In uh, writing under inspiration, of course, in the first couple of chapters, he reminds us of our blessings in Christ. We're seated in the heavenlies. We're saved by grace. And that's, that's great stuff. I'm glad that I'm saved. I'm glad that my salvation doesn't depend on me because I couldn't be good enough. I'm glad that my salvation doesn't depend on uh, doing a certain number of works because I would probably leave out the most important ones. My salvation has nothing to do with me and everything to do with God. Because He loved us, He sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross and save us from our sins. And so good works don't save you, but now that we are saved, we're supposed to do good work. I'm going to try that again because, you know, a lot of times people will agree with biblical principles and they'll respond by saying amen. Let me try that again. Uh, Now that we're saved, we're supposed to do good works. Sure. But if we're doing right and we're doing good, you can understand the devil's going to fight us. He doesn't want people to get saved. He doesn't want families to be strengthened. He doesn't want churches to grow. He doesn't want young people to surrender to ministry. So he'll do everything he can to keep us from living for God. And so in Ephesians 6, uh, God tells us how that we can arm ourselves for that warfare against the devil and his purposes. So if you're able to stand, stand with me, please. And I'll begin reading in uh, verse number 10 of Ephesians 6. Verse 10 says, finally. You know, that's a word preachers often say, but really don't mean. Finally. (laughs) Finally. What does that mean? It's like uh, uh, Henry VIII said to his third wife, "I, I won't keep you long. It was like the chubby kid that got caught in the barbed wire fence and his dad's helping him get loose and he says, just a few more points. Finally, finally, but I'm not at the end of my message, I'm just reading the scripture, so. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Bible. I thank you that... Although we do have an adversary, although there are enemies, that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And so, Father, I pray that our message this morning would be a help as each of us arm ourselves to do battle against the devil. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated, please. The Bible tells us that we are in a battle, and he reminds us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Who who are our enemies? Who is it that the saved person does battle with? Well, obviously, uh, we do battle against Satan and his devils. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 reminds us to be sober, 
to be vigilant because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You know, I think we've kind of become desensitized to the idea of the devil. We see these pictures of, uh, you know, a guy in a red suit with horns and a, and a, and a long tail and a pitchfork. Uh, that, that's not the devil. The Bible tells us that the devil uh, is, is as an angel of light. He's, he's deceptive. Understand, the whole purpose of the devil is to destroy the program of God. Way back in Isaiah chapter 14, we see the story how that uh, Lucifer was the uh, anointed cherub, but God cast him from heaven because of his pride, because of his rebellion. And so Lucifer became Satan, and his entire purpose is to do battle against God. And so the easiest targets to do battle against God are God's children, God's people. And so the devil spends his time trying to bother you and me. And when I say bother, there are several tools that he used. If he could, he would destroy us. The devil doesn't want you to live for God. He doesn't want you to serve God. He doesn't want you to help others. He doesn't want you to raise your children for the glory of God. Every single day, the devil, if it were possible, he would destroy you. But I learned in the book of Job that Satan can't do anything to me without God's permission. God said about Job to To Satan, he says, Hast thou considered my servant Job? An upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And Satan said, Well, sure, sure he serves you. Of course he loves you. Certainly he's going to be a good man. Look how you've blessed him. He's got a wonderful family. He's got riches and uh, his life is good. And Satan said, Lord, if you let me get at Job... I'll see if he still praises you. And so God gave Satan permission to afflict Job. I don't know how that affects you, but that encourages me. It encourages me, number one, because if the devil's bothering me, he had to get God's permission. And if God gave him permission, that means that even though I'm not sure I can make it, God knows that I can make it. And so the devil, he'll try to destroy us. And if he can't destroy us, he'll try to distract us, to get us away from uh, the purposes of God. He'll, He'll use whatever temptation to make us sin. He'll use whatever uh, uh, situation to cause us to get unfaithful. He'll, whatever tools are in his tool chest that he can use to keep you from being the Christian you ought to be, he'll do it. If there's friends that'll pull you away from God, he'll use friends. If there's false teaching that you get swallowed up in and, and, and caught by, he'll use false teaching. If, if it's uh, making money that keeps you from serving God, he'll make sure you get lots of money. Do you understand? The Bible says our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Every single day he's trying to destroy you. Every single day he's trying to destroy your family. Every single day, he's trying to keep me from serving God. And so, uh, he can't do it without our consent, but sadly, many of us just give in and let the devil have his way. But you know, it's not only that the devil and his devils that we do battle with, but also we do battle with the, the, the corruption, the sin of the culture, the world in which we live. I don't know if you've noticed it, But we're not really any longer a nation of Judeo-Christian values. We have that foundation, but uh, somewhere in the last century, we've come to the conclusion as a society, we really don't need God. We don't need his instruction, and we don't need his methods, and we don't need his values, and we don't need his principles, and so, you know, we just decide to do it on our own. Yeah, I wonder how that's worked. 
We look around and we see the, the horrible situation that our society is in. I read a statistic last year. For the first time in the history of America, more people said that they were atheists than said they believed in God. That's a sad commentary on our society. And, and, and sadly enough, I, I don't blame the wicked people. I don't blame the, the atheists that have gone on before. I, I think the problem is the church. The problem is that we haven't lived as if there was a God. We haven't obeyed God and we haven't served God. And so the world, without us being the light of the world, without us being the salt of the earth, has just grown indifferent to the things of God. And really the idea is, if God doesn't matter to me, why would God matter to somebody who doesn't even know him? And so there are enemies. There's the enemy of the devil. There's the enemy of our wicked society. But you know, the greatest enemy that I face is my own sinful nature. Paul, one of the greatest Christians in this Bible, talked about that battle going on in his life. He says, the good that I would do, I do not. He said, the things that I wouldn't do, those are the things that I do. Oh, wretched Man that I am, he said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Listen, every single day you and I do battle with sin. Every single day, many times during the day. And the only way to get victory over sin is to do it on purpose. You have to determine, I'm going to do right, I'm going to live right, I'm going to make the right choices. And that's easy to do when you aren't faced with the choice, but when the choices come, sometimes it's tough. And so God tells us that, that because of our enemies, we need to arm ourselves, we need to, to be prepared. And so he tells us to put on the whole armor of God. He says in verse uh, 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And as we read about the armor of God, you get the idea of a knight going to battle. You watch him clothing himself with that armor that will protect him in the battle. He tells us, first of all, stand Therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You want to do battle with the devil? You better saturate yourself in the word of God. You want victory over the devil? You better get to the place where where you not only respect the Bible because it's a holy book, you not only love the Bible because it's the Word of God, but you read the Bible and you live the Bible. Many of us one month ago made a promise to the Lord that we would do our best to read our Bibles every single day in January. I'm not going to ask you, but I wonder how many of you kept that commitment. How many of you kept that promise? Listen, every single, most of us didn't go a day without eating. Most of us could. Some of us should. But hardly any of us, unless you were ill or on purpose you fasted, Uh, None of us just got too busy to eat. None of us just forgot to eat. I forgot my fourth or fifth meal one day, but we didn't go the whole day without eating because that is important. How can we go the whole day without reading the Bible? You understand, it's the Bible that points us to Jesus. Everything we know about God, we know from the Bible. Every single thing that we know about God, we know that He's holy because the Bible tells us that. We know that that He's righteous. We know that He's merciful. We know that He has grace. We know that He loves us because the Bible tells us so. And so He says, you want to do battle with the devil? 
You want to be prepared for the wicked culture? You want to say no to your own sinful flesh? Then the first thing you need to do is to gird your loins with truth. You need to know the book. And then not just know it, but live it. Somewhere along the line, we have gotten to the place where our arrogance, and I'm speaking as a society, our arrogance is almost overwhelming. I hear statements like this. Well, I know the Bible says, but this is what I think. Are you kidding me? Who am I to put my thoughts over what God says? My mom, she she didn't put up with a whole lot of nonsense when I tried to reason my way out of trouble. Sometimes I would say, when she would tell me what I need to do, i say, but mom, I think, and she'd stop me, and she says, do you think I care what you think? <laughs> well, yeah, mom, I figured you probably wanted to hear it. No. When she said, do you think I care what you think, the obvious and immediate answer was, you don't care what I think. Well, when you tell me God says this, but you think this, As kindly as I can say it, I don't care what you think. It's the Word of God. It's not a collection of suggestions. It's the Word of God. And if we're going to survive, we have to have our family's foundation on the Word of God. And if we're going to survive individually, we're going to have to live our lives on the basis of the Word of God. Every single day, the devil's trying to destroy us. No wonder he said, have your loins girt about with truth. It's the Bible that helps us separate truth from error. Remember that story where the Sadducees were trying to trick Jesus? And they said, hey, we, we, we need to know the answer to this Bible question. There was a guy that got married and, and he died. And so according to the Old Testament, his wife's supposed to marry, supposed to marry his brother. And so they got married, and he died. And he had another brother, so she married him, and he died. And had another brother, and he married him, and he died. Seven brothers. If I'm the youngest brother, I'm leaving town. I mean, I'm, 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 I've got a sign on my door, not eligible. But they said seven brothers that she married and they all died and they said whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection and Jesus said ye do err not knowing the scriptures he said if you knew the bible you wouldn't ask a question like that if we knew the bible we wouldn't make choices like we make if we knew the bible and chose to live by it we wouldn't make decisions that we make and we certainly wouldn't make excuses and so God tells us that in order to arm ourselves to do battle with the devil to do battle with wickedness to do battle with the sinfulness of our own hearts the very first thing that we knew need to do is to gird our loins with truth and then he says in verse number 14 and having on the breastplate of righteousness. There's two kinds of righteousness in the Bible. There's the positional righteousness. By that I mean, when I got saved, I was clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. When you got saved, you were clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. You see... We're still sinners, but because of that righteousness, it's called imputed. Because of the righteousness of Jesus, God looks at us as if we'd never sinned. All of our sins are washed away. We're, we're, we're pure in the sight of God because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's our position. But because I'm saved... I'm supposed to do the right things. That's practical righteousness. What does righteousness mean practically? It just means do right. Do right. Sometimes when I'd go out with my friends, my my dad would say, don't forget who you are. Dad, 
I've got a good memory. 37 phone numbers. Just tsh, 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 tsh. No, he didn't mean I'm afraid you're going to get amnesia. He said you represent this family. You have a responsibility to those who aren't with you. Do right. Let me remind you that if we're going to win this great battle that we face against Satan, against the corruptive nature of our society, against our own wicked uh, temptations because of our carnal flesh, if we're going to win, we have got to do right. Amen. Several years ago, uh, Nike came out with an advertising slogan, Just Do It. That's the dumbest slogan I ever heard. I wish we had one for Christians that said, just do right. Just do right. Charles Spurgeon said, between two evils, choose neither. Just do right. Look, we're talking about warfare. We're talking about going to battle. God said, you better first of all gird your loins with truth. And then you need to put on that breastplate of righteousness. Just do right. Next verse. Verse number uh, 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The idea that I've, I've, I'm saturated in the word of God. I have, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. I'm choosing to do right. Now my job is I'm supposed to tell others. I'm supposed to tell others about Christ. You know, when we are faithful in our witnessing, now understand, I can't save anybody, you can't save anybody, but God uses faithful soul winners to bring people to himself. We used to, the church that I pastored in Missouri, we had a ministry to soldiers who'd come to Fort Leonard Wood. They were in basic training. And these people would come to our church not because they wanted to come to church, but because they wanted to get away from their drill sergeant. And so they were willing to come to church in order to have a complete day off. And so uh, we would get soldiers from every possible religious background you could imagine. Every Sunday, we'd have 100 to 400 soldiers. And in that crowd, you'd have, of course, some, some saved people. Uh, you'd have Baptists and all the Protestant denominations. But you'd have Catholics and Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses. You'd have Jews. You'd have Muslims. You'd have Hindus. And so every Sunday night, I would just preach a simple gospel message not what does our ch church teach, but what does the Bible say about how you can get to heaven? And I remember afterwards, I'd shake their hands on the way out. And it, it was not unusual to see dozens and dozens of those soldiers saved. But I, shaking hands on the way out, I remember one soldier shook my hand, tears running down his cheek. He said, Father, that's the greatest mass I ever heard. I said, did you get saved tonight? He said, yes, sir. I said, bless you, my son. <laughs> what a wonderful thing that Jesus saves anybody. Our responsibility is to take the gospel. It'll do two things. Number one, it'll keep you right with God because you'll feel like a rotten hypocrite talking to others if you're not doing right. And then secondly, it'll be a blessing and a help to everybody who hears the gospel. And so the Lord tells us in order to do battle, we, we have got to obviously have our loins girt about with truth and have on the breastplate of righteousness. We also need to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then he says, goes on and tells us, verse 16, above all, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Above all, that shield of faith. It was that, that, that faith that allowed us to trust Christ as Savior. 
And it's that faith that allows us to do right when we're confronted with evil. It's that faith that allows us to depend on God when we don't know where else to turn or what else to do. It's that faith that keeps us going because we know in myself, I can't do it, but God can do anything. And God can do everything. And so if we, by faith, just yield ourselves to the Lord, the devil tries to uh, convince you to do wrong, by faith we live right. The devil tries to discourage you, by faith we're encouraged knowing that this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. We feel like all my friends have deserted me, but thank God I know one by faith who promised never to leave me and never to forsake me. And so we have the breastplate, or I'm sorry, the shield of faith. And then verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. You see, make certain that you know the Lord. You're not going to live for God if you don't have that assurance nailed down. You know, I think one of the great tragedies of religions, so-called, are these that teach you can't really know that you're going to heaven. And even worse than those are the ones that teach, well, you could be saved today and lose it tomorrow. Man, if I believe that, I would just encourage people to get saved and then when they get baptized, stay under the water. That way you know you're going to heaven. (laughs) Salvation's not dependent on you, it's dependent on God. The Bible tells us uh, in, in the last verses of Jude, now unto Him that is able to keep you from falling. And to present you faultless before His presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Amen. I'm not saved because I do good. I'm not saved because I keep doing good. I'm saved because I have a good God. Amen. And then he gives us a weapon for our offense. Not just the helmet of salvation, but he tells us, uh, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Well, that's pretty amazing. We, We got the Bible mentioned twice. Not only are our loins be to gird, to be gird with the truth, but this is our sword. Your sword is your offensive weapon. Your sword is what you do battle with. And so he tells us, you, hey, what did David say? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. You struggling with your Christian life, I can just about guarantee your problem comes back to the book. You having trouble uh, with your temper? Your problem comes back to the book. You having trouble with your thought life? Your problem comes back to the book. Having trouble with bitterness or forgiveness or anger? Your problem comes back to the book. If we will just do what God says, it'll solve most of our problems. And the problems it won't solve, probably not worth solving. And then finally, he tells us, There's one area that our armor doesn't cover. We have a helmet, we have a breastplate, our loins are covered, our feet are shod, we have a sword, but our knees and our calves are unprotected. And so in verse 18, he says, praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance, And supplication for all saints. Twice in the verse we hear about supplication. Supplication means praying for other people. I would hate to think what it would be like for me to stand up here on a Sunday morning if nobody in our church had prayed for me. I would hate to think what it would be like for our teachers in our Christian school or our bus workers to get on their bus routes or, or uh, those who work in RU to, to uh, begin their RU time 
thinking that nobody had prayed for them. What a privilege we have to pray one for another. What an encouragement it is when people say, I've been praying for you. Whenever I'm facing a a big situation and somebody says, I'm praying for you, I always say, well, we'll see how effective your prayers are. But isn't it a joy when you're ill to know that people are praying for you? Isn't it a joy to know when you face a decision that people are praying for you? And so as we live our Christian life, as we battle against wickedness in our culture, as we struggle in our own lives, isn't it a blessing to know that people are praying for you? Yeah. And so God tells us, he said, he said, finally, you're in a battle. And so you have to prepare yourself for the battle. Arm yourself with the whole armor of God. He says, stand. Stand, therefore. No, we don't retreat. But we stand, therefore. Verse 14 says stand. Verse number 10 tells us to uh, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And so we arm ourselves We follow God's plan, we follow God's word, we follow God's will, and then we just simply do right. I'm preaching to a whole crowd this morning that's going through some struggle. Some of you struggling financially. Don't know how you're going to pay your bills. Some of you got things going on physically and you're doing your best to trust in the Lord, but there's still that, that worry and that concern. Some have situations in your family, unsaved loved ones, children who are away from the Lord, and you're trying to do right, and you're trying to be an encouragement, and sometimes you wonder, is God going to hear? Is God going to answer? Is this going to work out? I'm trusting God as best I can. I'm doing the best that I can. That's why the Bible says, stand, and having done all, stand. When you've done everything else you can do, just keep doing right. When you've exhausted your resources, just keep doing right. When you reach the end of your rope and you're not sure if you can hang on, just keep doing right. Listen, the whole key to our happiness and blessing and usefulness to God is if we just keep doing right. And so I want to encourage you this morning. See, you can't be involved in the battle and be distracted with all other things going on. It's either for God or it's for whatever else. And so it's it's jump in with both feet. It's sold out to God. Stand and then having done all to stand.